100 days in Tears of the Kingdom. Did I ever think this day would come? No. But being the trendsetter that I am for other creators to do it in the previous game, I figured why not? Time works the exact same as in Breath of the Wild, meaning 24 minutes in the real world will make up one day in the game, without cutscenes of course. From this point on, there will be spoilers, so look at your own risk. Let's get started. The first day begins with Zelda and Link investigating what is called the Gloom. This substance was leaking out from underneath Hyrule Castle, causing people of the land to become sick. While going deeper underground, we find ourselves looking at several murals. These all make up what was known as the Imprisoning War. What was thought to be legend soon turned to be a horrifying truth. Traversing down more stairs, we find ourselves with a man sealed in the middle of a room by a glowing green arm. The arm suddenly falls with some stone landing by Zelda, leaving this man able to be free from the seal. He immediately attacks Link and uses his power to raise the castle in the sky. Zelda falls with the tear in her hand into the abyss and Link was unable to catch her. Suddenly, this green hand catches Link and we are pulled away from the area. Day 2 begins with Link waking up from what felt like another 100 year nap, but this time with a new arm. A random voice welcomes Link and is relieved that he was able to survive even though his arm was beyond saving. He then turns around to grab this decayed master sword and then makes his way up through this mysterious area. I then found a spot for Link to put his hand up to, opening a doorway. Behind said doorway were some platforms to do Olympic dives off of to a nearby chest containing archaic legwear. From here, I see something that most nocturnal gamers fear. Sunlight. Jumping off of the platform revealed the logo to the game along with the beautiful view of the Great Sky Island. Getting closer to the giant building, I examined a Zonai construct which opened up and gave me a new device called the Purapad. And I noticed something. People kept asking all the time, if the Sheikah Slate was so good, where's the Sheikah Slate 2 at? Well fellow gamers, now we know. This construct then tells me that the giant building off in the distance is actually... That's the Temple of Time?! Look at the size of that thing, that's a massive temple! While heading there, I found something that many people can refer to as pain. Koroks. Yeah, ha, ha you little sh**! <laughs> anyway, at the temple I am again able to place my hand on the door, but it refuses to open. The same voice from earlier is heard again, and now takes on a spiritual form named Raru. He tells me the reason I cannot enter is due to skill issue. However, he offered me guidance to do some shrines on the island. Doing these would help give Link some abilities that would prove useful in all areas of the game. The first shrine I came across was called the Yuko Shrine, which gave the ability called Ultra Hand. Ultra Hand is useful for being able to merge objects together. You can make anything, literally. From a boat, to a plane, or even crucify Koroks in the grass. I see you people on TikTok, and trust me, I understand. I spent most of day 3 exploring the island, got several items, killed some constructs for parts, and then also got used to the new ability. I then entered the Inisa Shrine which also gave me another ability, called Fuse. With this, there are infinite possibilities to what can be made. Hammers, swords, maybe fusing some meat to an arrow. Fusing things together also helps to increase attack power, defeating enemies more efficiently. Leaving that shrine is what starts day 4. A Zonai construct was waiting for me and gives me this strange object called an energy cell. This aids as energy to power the Zonai parts, vehicles, and even weapons. The more cells I add, the longer I can use said things. After more exploration, I discovered a device dispenser. The more Zonai charges I put into these, the more parts I can get. Day 5 consisted of more exploration in the cold area of the Sky Island. I was eventually met with the Gutenbach Shrine along with the next ability known as Ascend. This was a new way to shoot your shot. Why slide in DMs when you can ascend into them? This ability also helps to go through high up ceilings and saves a lot more time in comparison to climbing. Once that was completed, Raru was outside waiting to tell us that we should be able to open the Temple of Dimes door now. Going inside the structure led to a giant stone. When Link touched it, it took him to this strange area. Princess Zelda was there with her eyes closed waiting to give Link the fourth ability known as Recall. Recall is basically the pre-slap of Will Smith. With most moving objects like boxes and wheels, you can rewind them and make them go in reverse. Not much deeper into the temple, there was another door to open. However, I needed another heart in order to do that. So Raru found one more shrine for me to enter and also showed us the ability of fast traveling. I get to the Natoya shrine on the sixth day because just like your average Twitch or YouTube streamer, reading is hard. And I made most of the way on foot. The shrine acted as the trial for recall, rewinding objects to help me get to the end of it. Each shrine also gives a light of blessing. Every four I collect, I can go to a statue to upgrade either my hearts or stamina. Opening the door triggered the start of the seventh day. Raru then wished me luck on my adventures, and I went to that mysterious glowing light at the end. And the sword. The cutscene. There's cutscene. The 
dragon. <laughs> Yo! What is, is that a tower? What is that? And that's, your first view is Hyrule Castle to the right. Are you ready to go down to the surface? I don't even think I'm ready. Do the thing, do the thing game. I know you're going to when I set foot on land. Now that I've touched some grass, the adventure finally begins. On the way to the tower-like structure, I fought some familiar enemies known as Bokoblins for some parts. Even getting familiarized with the boss Bokoblins, doing so would allow me to fuse and craft even stronger weapons. I reached a fort in front of the castle called Lookout Landing. People at the front of the gate told me to find Pura and assure her that I was safe and alive. After that, she wanted me to find Haas at the castle to now find Princess Zelda rather than finding the both of us. I ended up finding him at the end of the day, but what gave me the creeps was seeing the princess on the other side, looking down at the ginormous chasm, then ascending only to disappear right in front of our very eyes. Maybe being in the sky for so long took a toll on Link, so he decided to rest before going back and telling Pura what happened. For the time being, Pura wanted me to travel to the different regions of Hyrule to investigate the ongoing phenomena. It would be possible then to discover more clues about the princess. However, I did not have any map data, so that's where the Skyview Towers come into play. Joshua and Pura then power up every single tower where you can see them from afar. The lights! Ooh, look at that. Holy shit. So now all of them do that? Now all of China knows you're here. <laughs> Made me think of Mulan right away, and I can't tell you why. <laughs> you need a paraglider for when you're scanning. It takes a lot of skill, and nobody ha has what it takes. Thank you! I can't wait to see what this is going to look like. It's going to launch him into the sky? That just occurred to me. Oh my god! Yo! That's crazy! And now I have an area of the map. That's insane. It also shows in the sky, sky up map updated as well. After a successful test from the tower, Pora then tells me of reports coming from each of the four regions. I decided to start the investigation by going to Heber first. I found a few caves with new enemies in them called Horriblins, then discovered the Ishodak Shrine to get a Light of Blessing. Ending off the day, I found Impa by the new Serene Stable investigating a giant glyph. I fixed her hot air balloon and she told me of an old text referring to Dragon's Tears. She told me of a possible connection between the tears and the glyphs, but I didn't see anything at first other than a Korok sitting in one at the time. Day 9 consisted of farming for Bokoblin parts and even some boss Bokoblin parts wherever necessary. Then I went to the Sinekawak Shrine. I won't say how long it took me to figure out and complete said shrine, just know, way more than it should have. Now entering double digits. For day 10, I decided to visit Lunder's Brow Skyview Tower close by to get more map data. Doing so would make it much easier to navigate my way to Hebra. It also gave me some additional data as well, showing that only a small percentage of you that are watching are subscribed, so join the masses, and hey, if I hit a milestone, maybe I'll do 100 more days in Cheers of the Kingdom. We'll see. After shooting up from the tower, I discovered an island in the sky called Courage Island. I put my hand up to the pedestal, bringing up a green onion ring. I flew through some rings, which brought up the Tan Wee Shrine. The shrine was a quick tutorial on how to do mid-air attacks while in bullet time. After that, I would find myself at another tutorial shrine, the Makuruki Shrine. Inside, I learned how to do critical hit using arrows. Pretty quick in and out. Evening time suddenly hit and I noticed a stranger and his cart were more stuck than a step sibling in a ditch. I used Ultra Hand and some Zonai parts to get him and his cart out, ending off the day. Quickly approaching the Lucky Clover Gazette, Hyrule decided now was the time of the month and the Blood Moon reigned over the land, reviving every enemy I had slain. Inside this place, I met with Tracy who was also doing an investigation on Zelda. She tells me and Penn to visit every stable and see what the locals do. As I made it to Rito Village, I found out that most of the Rito had fled due to the harsh cold, lack of food, and trying to figure out the mystery of the sudden snow. Teba became chief of the village, and his son Tulin was dying to fly up in the sky and see how he could fix their problems. There was also mention of the Song of the Stormwind Ark, which talks of ships in the sky which Tulin rejects the song, saying it's not real. Annoyed, he flew off to Heber Mountain without a second to waste, and Teba asked us to follow him. A Rito member near the flight range said I would find Tulin and his friends in the Heber South Summit Cave. For a good chunk of the 12th day, I was still climbing that mountain. Eventually, I found the Sahira Shrine and figured why not get a quick, not so quick Light of Blessing. Entering the cave, I come to find out that Tulin was at the very end of the cave from his friends. It eventually opened up into a mountain pass with Tulin at the top, missing his bow. Tulin told me he lost his bow to an enemy, so I quickly helped him to get it back and defeat some enemies in the process. Soon after, he heard a distinct sound which shakes him up a bit. More friends come to our location and Tulin realizes he does not need to do everything alone. He then explained the reason his bow was stolen was due to him dropping his guard as he saw Zelda getting attacked by enemies and watching her fly into the clouds. 
Parth then relays a message to Tulin saying that he has permission to go up and investigate the giant storm cloud, as they believe that is the source of where the storm is coming from. Making it to Heber Peak, I come across floating islands and start to climb. The only way to get through the massive storm was to go through the top. The 14th day soon crept up on me while ascending higher into the sky. The higher Tulin and I went, the darker and colder it became. Just before reaching the giant ship in the storm, I went into the Kahatnam Shrine, which turned out to be Raru's blessing. A few bounces off some ships, and I find myself at the top of the storm, aiming to fall right in the middle of what I found out to be... Wind te Temple? That's right, the Wind Temple. I found a place to put my hand again, but the hatch on the ground would not budge. Tulin then hears the same voice from earlier that tells him how to open the hatch. First, I must deal with the five locks around the temple. While I did take a good while, I was able to successfully solve the lock puzzles one by one. Successfully opening the hatch revealed the Scourge of the Wind Temple, Kogera. Kogera. Scourge of the Wind Temple? Oh my god. The fight took place on the 15th day, and quickly enough, the Scourge's weakness was easy to spot. Just as the square piece fits in the square hole, Link fits perfectly through the center of Kogera's rings. Let's go! Huge. Kogera was at last defeated. The snow around Rito Village immediately melted, and now there was another stone right in front of us. It went up and went straight to Tulin. Touching it revealed one of the sages from the past. He told us of the imprisoning war from his perspective and asked Tulin to fulfill his vow as a sage. Accepting this burden had now turned him into the Sage of Wind. The stone helps to enhance the sage's abilities even more than they already were before. You did what? Does that mean I could summon that whenever? <laughs> you can use that ring to call on my power anytime, all right? That's awesome. After receiving Tulin's power, Rito Village was now saved, and Day 17 began. At the village, Seba expressed how proud he is of his son and gave him the Great Eagle Bow as he was now ready for it. I returned to Lookout Landing to check on the nearby chasm because I never went underground, and I figured now would be a good time. Oh, you literally just... I don't know how far down this goes. The depths. What is this, precious? Nisoyge Light Root. Ooh, it made everything brighter. Does this count as like the towers of the of the underground? Is that what I'm understanding? Because this is like a root, right? So you know, like tree roots, you know, they network. Is that how this function is? Am I right? Holy shit, I'm right. I gotta find more chasms. And more chasms will be found. Who knew that under the entire map laid the depths? It's absolutely crazy how much was down here the whole time. And quite frankly, I wouldn't mind spending 100 days down here. Like the video if you want that to happen. From the enemies to items and even random spots down here, I was thoroughly surprised. On the 18th day, I found the Hyrule Field Skyview Tower. I did die a few times to hire two enemies to get in there, but eventually, all I had to do was a gamer lean and my problem ceased to exist. The way to get into the plateau was still blocked off, and this would be the easiest way to get up there in comparison to climbing. While on the plateau, I soon realized there were chasms in four spots. Those were the exact same spots that the shrines used to be in during Breath of the Wild. I was also curious about the Shrine of Resurrection to see if anything was changed. To my surprise... Interesting. Wait, can I go down even more? I can. Where's the fifth divine beast? Oh! Uh, 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 there's a construct down here. Okay. Yeah, what is a Zonai construct doing down here? Please visit the great abandoned central mine in the depths and return here after. For that, I would possibly maybe big if on consider doing- Yeah, I completely forgot about that construct, I'm not gonna lie. While in the sky, I was curious about what the Plateau's Temple of Time name would be called, and I come to find out. It's still the same thing, they just added ruins at the end, patent pending. I wanted to see what happened with the old man's hut, to see if anything changed. It turns out that the Yiga clan turned that into like a mini base, and I wanted to see what was in there. Inside was actually a tailor with swift movements, assembling a piece of a Yiga clan member's outfit. Look at the map, look at the map! So this is where their, their bases are. So there's one on where I'm at, Great Plateau, then there's a, their actual hideout, there's one next to Korok Forest, one all the way in Akala, and that's it. Oh, nice. The next day, I entered the real Gok Shrine. To be honest, the shrine took the whole day with long sticks, but eventually I figured it out. When I left the shrine, I had a feeling of fright that I have never felt before in a Zelda game. I gotta hand it to them. I was not expecting it. Oh, hi? Yeah. 
that's the gloom? I was curious to see if the talus on the plateau would be in the same spot, and it was. Only difference was that it was a battle talus carrying other enemies and could get up faster. I was able to beat it and have more gems in the inventory whether I wanted to sell them or fuse them to my arrows. Reaching the 9 plus 10 day, I was feeling a little ballsy and wanted to go get the tower in the Heber region. I found out that the bridge there was broken, and being the good person that I am, I said I can fix her and use Ultra Hand to put the bridge together. Once completed, the game showed me that I had reached the Picketa Stonegrove Skyview Tower and another area on the map. Soon after, I discovered the Orochium Shrine, and this puzzle took me forever to do. On the bright side, I did discover a glitch in here, but unfortunately, it was a softlock glitch, and I had to do everything all over again. The next area I wanted to take a peek at was the Forgotten Temple to see what was the same and what was different. Structurally, the exact same, except no guardians, and behind the giant statue in the back of the temple was a secret room that contained all of the locations and the glyphs in Hyrule. And initially, nothing happened, so I may have gone there a little too early. On day 23, I had remembered there was a giant construct in the sky that I wanted to fight to see what the reward would be. Hitting it in the right spot several times is how I beat it, that's what she said. I went back to the ground and found the Susu Um Shrine and dealt with the stakes, and I'm not talking the gambling or the food kind. And to this day, I'm still convinced I 100% cheese the shrine, but hey, it's better than wind bombing and skipping the whole point of the puzzle, right? After the shrine, I decided to head back to the first glyph because I realized there was something I definitely missed. And I was right! I found a small puddle in the middle of the glyph, and activating it revealed to be a memory. But it wasn't Link's memory, rather, it was Zelda's. From here, we see that she survived the fall somehow by traveling to the past. She is then met by Hyrule's first founding king and queen. Raru and Sonia. Impa was then waiting for us to finish the memory and recalled seeing something about the geoglyphs in the Forgotten Temple. Luckily, I wasn't there that long ago, so it was pretty easy to navigate back. The next morning, I met with Impa again in the room with the glyphs. The map on the ground showed every location of where the memories were. Since the first one had a tier, that also implied that every single other glyph had one as well. So I went on a quest to find them all and see what would happen at the end. To get a good view from above, I used the Skyview Tower, then climbed the side of a mountain, finding the next memory. In here, we are met with a view of the Great Plateau, but it's not the same one that we know. Zelda remained worried, but Sonya gave reassurance that they will find a way. Raro then suggests that they talk to his older sister, Minoru, as she may hold ideas of how to return Zelda to her era. After this, I took a quick detour to Lookout Landing. I found Hestu standing there not so menacingly, and wanted to get more inventory slots. So he hooked me up and I traveled back to the Heber region where I found a geoglyph in the shape of Ganondorf. I was devastated by the memory I saw because one, I'm pretty sure it was not in the order I was intended to get it in, and two, Ganondorf killed the queen and stole her stone. On day 25, I reached the Yamiyo shrine where I was given a small tutorial on how to throw for content. Literally. I mean, I've done that in speedrunning, so I don't see how this could be any different. The next area I went to visit was the Elden Canyon Skyview Tower. Sadly, I could not immediately activate the door as it was locked from the inside. I noticed that the lid that covered the top of the tower was on the ground, so it was an easy call for me to go all the way to the top and fall through. I opened the door from the inside and then activated the tower, giving me more map data. Using the towers allowed me to get to the geoglyph in the shape of the Purapad, as well as get the Korok. Looking into the next memory, we see Minoru for the first time. She believed it was the power of the stones that allowed Zelda to travel to this current era. Minoru also explained that the stones enhance one's own abilities, but the stone chose to increase the time power within Zelda. She also tells of a forbidden act called Draconification, losing oneself to become an immortal dragon. Raru then suggests to Zelda to study the nature of her power which may lead to the answers that they need. For day 26, I decided to do some training before venturing off for the next memory. I first began in the Maya Chin Shrine doing some target practice, then in the Ten Ten Shrine to enhance my throwing for content even more than I already am. I then made it to the glyph shaped like a dragon to locate the next memory. Here, we get our first glimpse of rehydrated daddy, I mean, Ga I mean Ganondorf. He brought about a herd of Molduga in an attempt to take over the kingdom with brute force. Raru, Sonya, and Zelda combined their power to eliminate the herd in one shot. Ganondorf failed, but noticed the secret stone of the Zone on Raru's hand. By doing so, he had another idea in mind. Day 27. I located a new tower in West Nakluta to activate. The Sahasra Slope Skyview Tower. The door here was locked as well, but the Rito who was fixing it gave a hint of going to a nearby hill. And to be honest, it was the least helpful hint I could have ever gotten to get this tower because I was literally surrounded by hills. I did eventually find the exact cave and hill they were talking about, and I was able to get another area of the map. The next glyph I wanted to check out was actually in the Gerudo region, close to the highlands. I reached the Gerudo Canyon Skyview Tower just before a blood moon hit. I didn't see anyone around to fix it, so I decided to leave it for later on. In the morning, I found the glyph of what looked like Ganondorf kneeling and the next memory. It starts off with Ganondorf apologizing to Raru and Sonia. 
in his attempt for friendship and to become allies, Zelda is able to see right through him, warning the king and queen after leaving. The only reason Waru accepted Ganondorf's proposition was because he wants to keep an eye on him should things go wrong. On day 29, I made my way near Hyrule Ridge for the next glyph. This one appeared to look like Queen Sonya. It was fairly easy to find the memory because Impa was standing near it. We see Zelda talking to Sonya about learning to control her time power. In addition, she told both Raru and Sonya about Link, how he went from being a noble knight to becoming the hero of Hyrule, and suddenly hinting at feelings for him. For the 30th day, I went to explore more Sky Islands. I came across the Josiu Shrine, but the crystal was missing. A voice called out requesting to follow the light and retrieve it on the other side of a moving puzzle. It took some time, but I returned the crystal and got a light of blessing for it. Heading towards the next tower on day 31, I found the Isho Shrine. This tutorial shrine taught me how to shield myself from the haters and have excellent comeback skills such as the ratio with parrying. Later in the morning, I discovered the Rabala Wetland Skyview Tower. Now, I don't know if it was meant to be raining here the whole time, if this happened for anyone else, but to get inside and go around the thorns, I did this in the most scuffed way possible. I fused boards across two scaffoldings, enough to shield the top of the door, because thorns were still blocking, and here I would light a piece on fire, and I was barely able to squeeze my massive badonkadonk behemoth dump truck of an ass in, but I did it. The tower was activated along with receiving more data for the map. The next area of interest was around Luralin Village since there was a dagger shaped glyph over there. Upon getting to the village, Razel, the mayor, informed me that monsters took over and destroyed the place completely. I was then tasked to drive out the forces from each area. I had a few deaths here and there since my weapons I had on hand were not ideal, but one by one I was able to take out all of the enemies. I then made quick work aboard the pirate ship and even taking out the boss Bokoblin, saving the village. With the village saved, I was given the green light to go investigate the glyph and find the memory. What was portrayed was quite shocking. Ganondorf used a puppet in the form of Zelda to lure Sonya away from everyone else. Zelda herself saved the queen with recall for a moment only for Ganondorf to come from behind and kill the queen personally, taking her stone. On day 33, Link needed to clear his mind from seeing such a memory, so I figured I would visit some Sky Islands again. And over here, I found a dispenser that gave him some new Zonai parts as well as a construct to fight. There was actually a shrine quest to do here as well dealing with that construct, but I was dealing with skill issue and couldn't get that crystal to a higher platform at the time. Evening quickly came as I made my descent into Hatino Village. I came to check on the house and see why mushrooms were so trendy. The reason was due to a fashion designer named Cece. As she was showing me some of her best work, the mayor of the village named Reed barged in and was very upset. He claimed that Hatino was meant to be a farming village, not a trendy one. Although he was not a fan of the mushroom art, it was in fact making the village flourish and bring in new people. He could not accept change whatsoever and wanted to keep things as they were. Then Cece did something that no one expected. She brought up doing an election to settle the score. Now, I'm no Hassan Avi, but you can see when things are about to get political. Though I was curious about the election, I decided to hold off on it for the time being and visit the Hatino Ancient Tech Lab. When I got there, a sign was on the door saying if I wanted to go inside, I would have to talk to Robbie first at Lookout Landing. I had yet to find the camera ability and assumed it would be behind that door. Before going to Lookout Landing, I wanted to get the tower atop Mount Laneru. I figured it would be easier to collect some map data as well as get another fast travel point. Afterwards, I came across some more green eggs and onion rings to open up the Zakuzu Shrine. This shrine actually reminded me of the Eventide Island quest where your inventory was taken away and you would have to work with what's around you. I took out all of the constructs and I was given a light of blessing. The next day, I used a sky island to locate the next glyph. From up above, what I thought I saw was a jelly belly jelly bean, but it turns out to be the shape of a secret stone. The mind sees what it wants to see, I guess. I touched down to find a Korok and the next memory. In the memory, it was said that the last free village in Gerudo Desert had fallen. Minoru assured Raru that he was not alone in this fight. By taking the big risk, he opened the door behind him, and I soon realized that this location was the Forgotten Temple. One was given to the four sages standing behind him. The group then stood in a circle and vowed to serve the king and aid him in this dangerous task. With a few more glyphs to examine, I decided to go closer to Central Hyrule as well as activate another tower. I came across the Poplar Foot Hills Tower, but the terminal was not working and there wasn't a person in sight to fix it. Soon after, I investigated a cave where I found that person caught in their own trap that they were laying. They were quickly freed and able to fix the terminal, allowing me to activate it and get more map data. I then made my way over to a glyph that looked like a tombstone. I was then met with the memory of Raru grieving his loss of Sonia. Zelda approached and told him that before coming to the era, she found a man underground confirmed to be Ganondorf. He had lived all the way up to her time, so no matter what would happen, they would ultimately fail. As calm as could be, Raru accepted this fate and was still willing to try to defeat the Demon King. As it fails safe, the last line of defense would be Link. Raru mentioned something that stood out to me and how this could possibly mess with the timeline. A paradox, if you will. He said that there was a future where Zelda was never there in that era, but was there now. So how could Ganondorf have been sealed prior to this? A closed loop? 
Just like the Ouroboros on the game's logo, oh my god! On day 37, I returned to Lookout Landing, realizing I was still missing two abilities. I would then find Robbie and Josha talking about the depths. Josha had a very interesting theory that there used to be people who lived in the depths. She couldn't go down the chasm, but gave me an idea of what to look for, with Robbie being able to teach me how to take pictures. Reaching the depths, a member of the research team informed me that Robbie ran ahead, leaving everyone behind in the dark. I navigated pretty blindly until I found him the next morning next to a light route. I activated the route, revealing a giant statue of unknown origin. Robbie then unlocked the camera function in the pad, and I snapped a picture of it. We then returned to the surface and I went to Hyrule Castle to cook up a lot of dishes as well as farm up some enemy parts refusing later on. I was very curious to see what would be under Hyrule Castle on the 39th day. I assumed that the entirety of the depths was connected where I can walk from one end to the other. Not necessarily. What I saw on the way down was truly incredible. Look at this. I'm glad I wasn't immediately met with like, final boss, fight. Genuinely though, I do want to go down all the way just to like run and find out. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Gloom's approach. What is that? Is that the Zonai stuff? Right there, those are the Zonai lights. What the, <gasps> what could be down here? It's going down even more. The power of a sage cannot reach you. I'm so low it can't reach. I beat them. Phantom Ganon? I'm sorry, what? Oh my god. Oh, let's go. What's gonna happen now? He dropped this. A Gloom Spear? That was insane. He dropped a bow. The Demon King's bow. I think this is the beginning of the game, dude. Forgotten Foundation. What, is what the hell is that? Is that a... Is that a Redead? A Gibdabone. It's a Gibdo, not not a Redad. Okay, I can I can go, I can go. Oh, I was right. This is the mural. Roru and the Zonai and the Highly. This is everybody teaming up together to take on Ganondorf. Zelda receives the Master Sword of some sort and a dragon. People are praising a dragon. I'm gonna go down even lower from where he fell. The music, dude. The music. The Gloom's Lair. Central Hyrule Depths. The way I am scared of- Zelda's torch! It's right there! Oh, I am- I think this is final boss territory. Oh my god. Look at this! What is he doing in there? He's in there right there. Did you really think I was about to go to endgame right now? Nah, I fast traveled immediately. I was not ready for that. I still wanted to find the last memories and get every tower. So I made my way to Typhlo Ruins. The Skyview Tower would not activate because a platform was blocking the top. So I climbed my way up with rocket shields and moved it out of the way. I was then able to get a map and find where the next geoglyph was. I come across the Master Sword shaped glyph and immediately find the memory. Zelda was standing in the Temple of Time by herself stating that they were able to restrain Ganondorf. However, she was still unsure if Link even had a fighting chance still. She walked outside and saw the same glowing orb that Link saw in the beginning of the game. Incredible as it was, it turned out to be the Master Sword that traveled back in time to the first era. Zelda grabbed it and realized why she was sent to that era and it was only something she could do. Immediately after seeing the memory, we see the same dragon that opened out the cloud barrier. I think- oh. <laughs> That's Zelda! That's the Master Sword! Lodged in the head. And that's a tear of the dragon. Another memory. A final memory? That makes sense. I now made it a mission to get the last memory. I spent most of day 42 traveling and climbing to get there. There was no nearby activated tower for me at the time, so I found the Demizuin Shrine at Akala Citadel and completed the tricky puzzle to end off the day. It was on the way, so I took a little detour and visited Terrytown. I wanted to check in on Hudson and Ronson, and I found out that they had a child. While here, I went to the statue for a quick heart and stamina upgrade as well. Landing at the island, I was excited to see the final memory. Before doing so, I went into the Jamimic Shrine to collect the Light of Blessing. We were shown a different view of the Temple of Time with Zelda looking out towards the sky. All of the memories are coming together for her, reflecting on her sacred power and time. We saw what looked like a spirit flame fly down into the Purapad before it was given to a Zonai construct. She then ate the stone, took the Master Sword, and transformed into the dragon we currently see flying around in the present day. Dragon's Tears. Complete.
As day 44 approached, I wasn't sure if I was ready to reclaim the Master Sword, so I went to the old Re Mountain Skyview Tower to help install the new terminal. After a quick fix, I was given some map data showing the area around me. Then, I went on a search for the Crystal Refinery in the Sky Islands. The reason I wanted to go back was to see if I can get more energy wells for the energy cell, but I was speaking the broke and I couldn't get anything. Day 45 was the day I decided to explore around the Gerudo area and maybe even find the person who could fix that Skyview Tower. While that guy was nowhere to be found, I did find a cave around Spectacle Rock and did a lot of climbing around the highlands. It seemed that the climbing had paid off because I discovered the Gerudo Highlands Skyview Tower. I didn't see a doorway nearby, but I found a journal in a tent talking about there being building parts in the close by cave. Inside the cave, I followed the water all the way down to the end, finding the bottom of the tower. I used a send and found the way into the tower, activated it, and got more map data. After that, I may have gotten a little sidetracked by discovering the Burrito Lookout Chasm. I mean, how could I not? It was so easy to get lost down here and try to find every single light route as possible. After spending half the day underground, it was time to make my way to Gerudo Town. I found a secret tunnel that led to a shelter where everyone was hiding. I was immediately stopped and threatened because men are not allowed to be in Gerudo Town, but the warrior captain Bellario told them all Link had permission to be there. She also said Gibdo were popping up everywhere threatening the town. The warriors were unable to investigate the source of the storm because this enemy was popping up everywhere posing as a threat. Bellaria then tells me Riju was training in the ruins to the north. On day 48, I wanted to check out the desert while the storm was around just in case there were any possible secrets I can only find at this time. Going through the desert rift, I didn't see anything, not even a single Korok, but I did find a Molduga randomly, so I guess that counts for something. Karakara Bazaar also appeared to be the same as well, except for the guy you normally get the Gerudo Sowal from, they were nowhere to be found. I was still fixated on getting that one Skyview tower up and running from earlier, so I went back and this time I checked the other side. And as a matter of fact, someone actually was waiting there, but the makeshift elevator was broken. Using Ultra Hand, I used a couple of boxes as weight, bringing the guy up. The tower was then activated the next day, and I was able to get some more map data. To continue the story, I was flying towards the ruins, but surprise, surprise! Sidetracking kicked in faster than the second cup of coffee Nomi does for me at 3 p.m., and I've been fallen down the East Gerudo Chasm. Luckily, I was not down there long, but I did find a light route to brighten up the area. I eventually made it to the ruins, and we see that Riju is training with lightning power, without the Thunderhelm. While she was able to pull off such incredible attacks, she was also dealing with skill issue. She asked Link to shoot arrows at some dummies to perfect her aim, and it actually worked. As Riju was getting used to this power, she heard a noise that she couldn't quite make out. Then a Garuda warrior came and alerted that Karakara Bazaar was under attack by a Gibdo. I made my way there where Riju and I immediately took down the threat. It turned out, normal attacks can't defeat the Gibdo, only elementals can. We then see Zelda walk towards Gerudo Town with giant sand tornadoes forming around it. Gibdo hives were forming around preparing for battle. I assisted the Gerudo by having blockades and warriors stationed around each side of the town. With Riju's lightning ability, all of the Gibdo and the hives were destroyed. The town was saved, but Riju was still thinking about the mural in the shelter. In the description, it's said to unite the pillars and light to reveal the lightning stone. Entering the halfway point, I left the town and saw a pillar of light aiming off into the distance right behind the throne. I followed it to find another pillar not faced the correct way. With a quick turn, I realized I was forming a Dorito chip shaped light. Not long after, I found that last pillar, turned it, and completed the shape. I went to find Riju right away because I saw the lightning stone rise up from the ground. Using her power on the stone revealed a giant structure, the lightning temple. Before going inside, we were met with the boss of the temple, Queen Gibdo. After a few hits of damage, it flew off leaving its spawn of regular Gibdo behind. I killed the rest of them and broke off a piece of the hive that blocked the entrance. Entering this behemoth of a temple, I find out that there are seven floors to it, with the queen awaiting me at the top. Going deeper into the temple, I discover the Room of Ascension along with the pedestal for my hand to activate the elevator, but it wouldn't budge. Riju then heard the same voice informing her that both her and Link need to power four batteries in the area. This took me about two in-game days to solve the puzzles and charge the batteries, but once I got the elevator to work, I would be on my way to fight the queen. The fight was fairly easy with Riju's help, several lightning strikes and attacking the head. Once defeated, the stone presented itself to Riju. We then saw the Sage of Lightning who gave the same story as the Sage of Wind but from her perspective. Riju then accepted the task to aid Link in defeating Ganondorf and became the Sage of Lightning. After getting Riju's vow, I was very curious about the Yiga Clan hideout and wanted to see if anything there changed. When I got there, there was a random door that was never there before. A person guarding said to basically find the whole outfit that was spread among the three branches in the kingdom. Well, I already had one piece of the set and just needed to go find the other two. So I went back to the hut on the Great Plateau to view the locations again. One was the Akala Ancient Tech Lab and the other was a cave close to the castle. On day 55, I found the Jochi Iyu Shrine close to the Tech Lab where I got a Light of Blessing. Defeating the Yiga soldiers that I promised you was my first try unlocked the door. I freed another stylist and received another piece of the armor. And I also found the prototype of the Traveler's Medallion. 
Before going to the next area, I wanted to check out Makar Island next to the forest. It happened to be more gloom hands that shockingly gave me a hard time. I then had a quick and easy fight with Phantom Ganon before starting the next day. On day 57, I found a cave containing the last piece of armor. Defeating the soldiers freed the last stylus who just finished making the last piece of armor. I was then told to wear the whole set with caution as people will think I'm actually a part of the Yiga clan. I then decided to take a scenic route back to the hideout and totally didn't get sidetracked in the cave for the rest of the day. Ready to dismantle the establishment? I didn't really pose as a threat inside the hideout. The members who were selling things in there should be though, because I mean, look at these prices! This is not very cash money of them. Deeper into the hideout, I talked to a foot soldier that gave me some shocking yet hilarious intel. So you know when we thought the trees around the kingdom were sentient? Turns out it was actually these idiots disguising themselves as trees. Kind of makes sense if you think about it. To end off the day, I went into the Rotsumamu Shrine right next to the Yika Clan hideout chasm. Inside the quest was a balance plan. The plan was simple. Cheese the puzzle and collect the Light of Blessing. For day 59, nothing too noteworthy happened. I explored the hideout chasm for most of the day and then fought a Flux Construct 1 for some parts. The next day, I returned to the castle in the sky as I wanted to do some weapon farming again. Before doing so, I found the Dusk Bow while climbing to the very top. I wanted to see if a Korok would be at the top of the castle again, and it was! I then went to familiar areas from speedrunning and got a few good bows and weapons as well. The map was yet to be complete, so I went back to the Uplands Arena Skyview Tower the next day to try to fix the issue. This mysterious goop was everywhere, and as dumb as it sounds, I really tried the have you put it in water thing? Before I knew it, I was actually playing Super Mario Sunshine with extra steps. After completing the sky and surface map, I temporarily joined the Sphere Squad because that was the one thing that did not fit in the square hole. After initiation, I was shown the Druid to Gumak Shrine as well as a Zonai Parts Dispenser. On day 62, I remembered a Zonai Construct told me of the Great Abandoned Central Mine. So I went down the Great Plateau North Chasm putting two and two together. Lo and behold, there it was. I found some researchers down there next to the Construct. Activating this Construct gave me an amazing ability that would break the game as well as save a lot of time. Auto Build. Auto build can create anything from memory with the push of a button. The researchers were surprised by this and asked to test it out on their conveniently broken down vehicle. They then called out to the master and I found out who it actually is. Master Koga. He gives it to a job well done, credit where credit is due of course. And before doing the same to Link, Koga remembered that Link was the one who defeated him and casted him down into the depths. He now lives for vengeance on Link and Zelda and the next thing I knew, I was in a boss fight with him. Again. Even with switching up his tactics by using a car, he was pretty easy to beat. For some reason, Koga told Link that he was going to get the same power at the southwestern abandoned mine even though I'm pretty sure this was the only spot you can get it from. After he left, the construct informed me that the mine he was referring to was the abandoned Garuda mine. All I had to do was follow his trail. Getting closer to the mine, I came across the South Lomai Depths Labyrinth. It blew my mind because in the trailers and the teaser footage, all we've seen was the surface labyrinths and the labyrinths in the sky. This was completely new territory to me. The next morning, I made it to the abandoned Garuda mine where Koga was waiting. Instead of driving around, he chose to fly instead. Unfortunately for him, he chose Spirit Airlines and he lost quicker than giving me the spiel of how I beat him years ago. And again, he kept self-reporting on where he would go next, the Eastern Abandoned Mine. And for safety measure, the construct then told me it was in the Lanero region. For day 64, I traveled to the Oculus Citadel where I trained with the Thunder Gliok for quite some time. The fear that this gave me reminded me of when I first found a Lionel in Breath of the Wild. Speaking of, I was never able to find one casually. Hopefully they show. Starting off the next day, I made it to the Lanayru Abandoned Mine. Koga turned into Mr. Struggle as he could not unlock the same power. Outraged, he wanted to fight a losing battle yet again. Koga pulled a Wind Waker for this fight since cars and flying did not work. I beat him faster than the last time and he said that the Yika clan had enough crystallized charges and apparently they found the Demon King. Again writing himself out, he left for the Northwestern Abandoned Mine for a final excavation in the Heber region. It seemed like there would be just one more fight with Koga, so I went to Satori Mountain to stack up more food for the inventory, as well as complete the Sonopen Shrine for a quick Light of Blessing. I went back to Lookout Landing, remembering that Robbie could open the door to the Hatino Tech Lab. By doing so, he would be able to improve the Pura Pad by giving it a sensor. As I got closer to my house in Hatino Village, I noticed that there was something in the well. Zelda had many secrets, even a diary entry saying that she made a handmade tunic for Link that was hidden in the throne room. I couldn't resist finding out about the tunic, so I lit the torches on fire, revealing the location. After acquiring the drip, Robbie gave the Pura Pad a sensor as promised, where I tested it by finding Raru's blessing in the Maya Hissik Shrine. He also fixed up the travel medallion so I can place it down anywhere I want and travel with ease. I don't know how or why it took so long, but I finally visited Kakariko Village. There were several rings from the Sky Islands that crashed and launched itself into the hills. To get a quick fast travel point, I ran through the Makasura Shrine then went to the statue to pray for an extra heart. 
I then went to talk to Paya, who was now the chief of the village. We also met Toro and Kalip, architects, who wanted to study the ring ruins. Apparently, they were given orders from Princess Zelda to stay away and to not investigate the ruins. Figured I would save this for a later time, I used the Sky Islands to travel closer to the Hebra abandoned mine. Before going down that chasm, I went into the Runikit Shrine. Puzzles can be challenging, thus the rest of the in-game day was taken up by trying to solve the shrine. On the very nice day that is day 69, Paya was too busy being the best girl and the chief of Kakariko Village. It was too bad since I wasn't able to test out the move Fuse with her. So I found the Rito Village chasm that led all the way down to the abandoned Hebra mine. Kogo was meditating and waiting for me as day 70 began. He apparently had enough crystallized charges and a gift for the Demon King. It was a Zonai construct but with the Yiga Clan accessories attached to it. I played enough punch out to know how to beat this thing and landing the last blow crumpled the construct. Koga then pulled out one last move, the Koga Rocket. Unfortunately, he got caught in it and it sent him flying around the room. Before it sent him to the sky, he claimed he will have revenge. On day 71, I made my way to Zora's domain to try to help with the sludge. I cleaned up the statue in the middle of the square only to realize that this was not Mifa, rather it was Link riding on Sidon's back during Breath of the Wild. The green Zora was newer to the domain with an unknown origin. I found out she was actually Sidon's fiance named Yona. She told me that Sidon would be found atop Plamis Mountain in Mifa court and a visitor afterwards for a quick chat. I didn't feel like going back and forth, but Yona said that they were trying to repair the Zora armor. All that was needed was an ancient arowana to which she said the blacksmith Dento may know where to find one, and he said I would be able to find one near Mifa's statue. After spending most of the day climbing to the top, I got a quick light of blessing from the Ihen A shrine before going to the statue. Lucky for me, there were plenty of arowana in the water, so I grabbed one for the armor and a few for a quick snack. I returned to the domain early the next morning to give Yona the fish and receive the Zora's armor. This armor would grant the ability to swim faster as well as swim up some waterfalls, eliminating climbing and losing stamina. Returning to Sidon revealed that he was trying to separate the water from the sludge as the source of their water comes through that area. For clues on how to deal with the problem, Sidon directed me towards one of the historians named Giato. Meeting him by Total Lake, we see him reading some remnants of a stone slab. However, most of it was missing, so he could not complete the translations. Conveniently enough, the rest of the slab was outside covered in sludge. Once the slab was put back, it said I needed to stand on the land of the skyfish. A droplet would await me among floating rocks and I would need to shoot an arrow at the said droplet with the mark of the king. I relayed this news to Sidon and he believed that the mark of the king was his father, Dorfin. He had left the domain to investigate the sludge but had yet to return. I had no luck finding him until day 73 behind a waterfall along with Muzu. He then explained that Princess Zelda came to the domain along with the floating islands appearing in the sky and sludge was raining down. Dorfin left to investigate and apparently Zelda came down from the sky on the sludge monster. She unleashed it on the king, completely catching him off guard. While he vanquished the threat, he was severely injured, thus remaining in hiding. If there was word that the princess even harmed the king, there would have been a potential war and betrayal to both Hylian and Zora alike. Everything was leading up to the sky, I just needed to find a way to get there. He gave me a few of his skills as that's what the Mark of the King referred to. Going back up to the floating isle, I soon discovered a droplet in the sequence of rocks and shot the scale right through it. Doing so caused a green light to travel to the reservoir. Sidon then had an idea to create a whirlpool so I can travel below. Inside, I discovered the ancient Zora waterworks where I cleared a few pipes to get to the terminal. A giant waterfall appeared and I was able to use it to send myself skyward up to the Wellspring Island. I used every means necessary to climb to the top. Interestingly enough, the higher I traveled, gravity became less and I was able to moon jump. Eventually, I made it to one last water that would take me to the highest point. At the top actually laid the water temple. At the end of the temple, Sidon and Link found the source of the sludge. After attempting to activate the terminal, there was not enough water to bring down the sludge. Sidon then heard a voice saying to use the other four faucets then activate that terminal. Only then will there be enough water. So I spent all of day 75 and part of 76 turning the faucets on. Activating the terminal again revealed the boss of the water temple called Mukdarok. It used the form of baby shark to get around and spit out the sludge. Using water to hydrate and not dehydrate proved to be useful and I eventually beat the boss. The secret stone was cleaned off and went straight towards Sidon. Upon touching it, we are met with the Sage of Water. The Sage then told the story of the imprisoning war from her perspective. Sidon then accepted the vow that the previous Sage had to fight alongside Link and defeat the Demon King. All of the water around Zora's domain was now purified and clean. Dorfin thanked Link for saving their home, then looked to Sidon. Acknowledging his contribution to what happened, Dorfin told his son he was now worthy of being the king and wearing the crown. This was on his mind for quite some time and he was now certain this was what he wanted to do. Sidon accepted the throne and would become king of the Zora, ruling alongside Yona. The next day I went back underground and no, not to get lost and look at everything, but to find treasure. Earlier on I found an old map that showed an X at the four islands to the east. As I got to the chest, the Gloomhands and Phantom Ganon got in the way. They were a quick and easy fight and inside the chest laid the Cap of the Wind. To end off the day, I got more inventory slots from Hestu and found the Geosyn Shrine. I know earlier I kept making jokes about the square piece fitting in the square hole, but let me tell you, this shrine was literally that. On day 79, I decided to prep for the adventure to Goron City. On the way there, I found the Kisinona Shrine and two guys trying to decipher Misko's treasures. A hint in a bottle basically said to feed a dog and it'll show you the way. 
Feeding the dog a few apples led me to a chest containing the ember trousers. While feeding the dogs in the game is cute and adorable, we still can't pet them? Why, Nintendo? Why? With 20 days left to go, I did a little four-wheel drive up the mountain and even beat up an igneo talus for looking at me funny. As I got closer to Goron City, I went into the Markuguk Shrine that taught me four-wheel driving also included lava. When they say all-terrain, they really mean all-terrain. By evening time, I made it to the city and something caught my attention. It wasn't hot here. I was able to walk around in normal clothing and not get burned. But to be on the safe side, I did buy the heat resistant set. Most of the Goron were eating this new substance called a marbled rock roast. Their eyes were glowing bright red and they couldn't stop eating. It was actually kind of creepy. Yonobo then showed up from behind with a spitting new look. For some reason, he reminded me of this old cartoon called Mucho Lucha. Maybe it was the mask, but bestie, it was not the look for you. I called him out on it and he immediately wanted to fight. There was definitely something wrong with that mask as it lit up bright red, almost malice-like. Breaking the mask brought Yonobo back to his old self. He said Princess Zelda gave him the mask when he went to investigate Death Mountain, and everything since then was a blur. After Yonobo made an apology video claiming to have made a huge error in severe lapse in judgment, we climbed up Death Mountain. He did have a nifty ability where he would roll at mock speeds that would break down heavy rocks or plow right through enemies. As we made it to the top, we saw Princess Zelda walking straight through the crater of Death Mountain. The malice at the top took a solid form of monsters called Moragia. Yonobo realized this was the marbled rock that the Gorons were eating. One by one, the heads toppled, revealing the way into the volcano. Without hesitation, we jumped in. I activated the light route near a giant structure, and Yonobo heard a voice calling out to him. Approaching the structure on day 82 was revealed to be the Fire Temple. Link and Yonobo went to the terminal, and the same voice called out to him again. It told him we would have to ring five gongs in order to open the padlocks. This temple was very unique in utilizing the railcar systems. However, it became somewhat confusing, and I was losing my mind. Did you know fusing rockets to shields and flying up could save you time and frustration? Now you know. Once the last padlock was opened, it became day 84. I went inside and was met with the scourge of the fire temple, the marbled goma. I would arguably say this was the easiest boss after Kolgera. All I had to do was use Yonobo's ability at its legs and hit the eye. Not long after, I defeated the boss with the secret tear coming down from the ceiling and going straight to Yonobo. He touched the tear and we were met with the sage of fire. Again, hearing the same spiel of the imprisoning war, but from his perspective and now asked to honor the same vow. Yonobo accepted it, becoming the Sage of Fire, and aiding Link in hopes to defeat the Demon King. With the regional phenomena solved, I returned to Lookout Landing to tell Pura what I know. And there was a reoccurring theme throughout all of this. Princess Zelda was behind everything. Suddenly, a massive blood moon spawned near the castle with the princess looking down at everyone. No one could go up there to reach the castle, so Pura told me to go follow and confront her so she can explain everything. I met up with Zelda at the second gatehouse, only for her to turn and disappear to be replaced by monster forces. When I defeated them all, she was waiting somewhere else, and I realized that this would happen a few times. Defeating the last enemy showed her waiting at one last spot. Reaching the sanctum, I was met with Zelda using a power to restore the place and was told to take in everything around me as this would be the last spot I would ever see. It turns out it was Ganondorf the entire time that used a puppet to look and act like Zelda. I was then met with Phantom Ganon again, but this time there are multiple of them with the larger health bar. Eventually, I was victorious. Ganondorf threw out an attack I was unable to dodge, but the four sages came to my aid. The Demon King then showed us all a memory of him exploding malice into the sky to spawn every enemy possible. He then faded away, leaving everyone concerned. Riju then realized he disappeared because he was not yet at his full strength. So we all returned to Lookout Landing to come up with a new plan. Pura realized there were six sages that fought alongside King Raru. We were still just missing the one, Minoru. To end off the day, I went back to Hitano for one reason. Well, two. The first was to finish the election side quest, and the other, cheese is in this game! Yeah. Oh, and once you do the quest, CC helps you out to put the Hylian hood down while still wearing it. I returned to Kakariko Village to inform Miss Payaya and Toro that the princess that gave the order to avoid the ring ruins was actually a puppet, and the real one had yet to be found. Toro noted that one of the floating rings was hollow, meaning I could use a sen to go inside. Inside the ring was a slab written in the language of the Zonai. I snapped a quick pic for Snapchat and showed it to Toro. Upon translation, Minoru was mentioned along with the hidden key to the southeast that Paya deciphered was the Dragonland. Dragon these nuts. Putting everything together, it became clear that it was crucial to travel to the Zonai ruins in the Fey Aeron region. On day 88, I met with Toro in the ruined part of the area. He found scriptures that read to wear an electric garb along the wide-mouthed forest serpent. Using Geogester, it became clear to acquire the pieces of the set at the Dragon Pillars and go to the tail. Inside the first pillar was the charged shirt. I then collected the charged trousers and the charged headdress. At the end of the tail, I put a Zonite charge on an altar. Lightning then struck each of the four Dragon Pillars, revealing the Thunderhead Isles. I then traveled up to the Isles, and from the map's point of view, it was in the shape of a dragon. Pretty neat. By the end of the day, I made it to, you guessed it, Dragonhead Island. I found a giant door similar to the one on the Great Sky Island and thankfully had enough hearts to open it. Behind it was Minoru's owl accessory. When I interacted with it, the platform below Link opened up and the accessory shot out a green light. I then heard a voice asking me to take the accessory and follow the light. 
I reached an owl altar that showed yet another spot to put it down on. The same voice uses the platform to guide us below ground, saying that we need to meet them as soon as possible. The area I was taken down to was the construct factory. Putting this accessory in the square hole revealed that the voice I was hearing was Minoru's. Due to the damage she took from Ganondorf, she no longer had a physical body and remained in spiritual form. To be able to speak face to face, she revealed four storehouses to get the body parts for this construct. Over the next two days, I acquired both a set of arms and legs. Putting everything together powered the construct body and Minoru was able to move. I now needed to recover her secret stone that she hid away in a different location. On day 91, I made it to the spirit temple where the stone laid. Unlike the other four temples, building the construct was basically the trial rather than activating something. As I walked towards the stone, Malice was all over the floor and it seemed a little too easy just to grab the stone without a boss fight. Immediately, my intuition was right and a giant corrupted construct came down and initiated a fight. A few good blows to the sharp rope and it withered away, dropping a heart container. When I got the stone, the pearl pad was glowing. Minoru's spirit came out from it and touched the stone, which fused to the construct. I was then able to see Minoru in her physical form for just a moment. She then told the story of the Zona and everything written on the mural, up to the point where we saw the Demon King sealed. With his final act, Raru went up close to bind Ganondorf's magic with his hands, sealing them both. He knew what would happen thanks to Zelda. Raru then told Ganondorf that he would one day be defeated by someone who wields the sword that seals the darkness, Link. After Ganondorf was restrained, Zelda told Minoru she would perform the forbidden act of eating a secret stone to restore the Master Sword and be able to give it to Link in the present era. Now that I was ready to reclaim the sword, I was told to go visit the Great Deku Tree. On day 93, the Lost Woods looked like a California forest fire with no way around. If I couldn't go around, perhaps going under was the move. So I dove down the Minchi Woods Chasm and walked until I was aligned with the Korok Forest. After using Ascend, I was near the Great Deku Tree. For ease of fast traveling and getting a light of blessing, I also found the Musanakir Shrine close by. The Deku Tree said he had the gnarliest hangover and was not feeling good. He then asked to help him with his stomach ache by diving below and checking out the problem. When I got there, I was immediately attacked by Phantom Ganon. A few quick slices and dices and it was gone. The black haze was lifted around Link as well as the forest. The great Deku Tree thanked Link and was eternally grateful. Apparently the last time he and him interacted was when Link and Zelda returned to the forest to receive the fully restored Master Sword. Interestingly enough, the sword can heal itself no matter the damage dealt to it. It can become stronger if bathed in sacred power. Even though I never went and received it, the great Deku Tree was able to sense the sword in the northeastern part of Hebra. It was in the sky, moving. And then I remembered it was lodged into the light dragon that was Princess Zelda. When I went to pick up the sword, the dragon freaked out and Link was holding on for dear life. To get the sword, no hearts were needed to my surprise. I needed stamina actually, which I had plenty of. I didn't need to place a campfire anywhere. I didn't need a scuttlebug for half an A press. I just needed to hold harder than crypto bros who think they have diamond hands. When enough stamina was used, Zelda calmed down and flew high into the heavenly clouds. Link was able to firmly grasp the master sword and pull it. Now that the Master Sword was returned to Link, the last thing to do before the end game was to train and get plenty of rest. I took on a few flux constructs throughout the day to practice patience and dodging. It was easy for Link, not even posing a threat. The next day I returned to Hyrule Castle to farm more weapons, but in particular, I wanted the Hylian Shield. To receive it, I would have to light the giant torch down by the docks. It's the same one you would light in Breath of the Wild to pull up a shrine. Earlier into the 100 Days Challenge, I noticed this large structure in the sky and at first thought it was a castle. Only reason I never went there until now was because of battery limit and uh, <clears throat> skill issue. Upon arrival, this place was revealed to be the Zonite Forge Island. There were large fans I used to be able to glide and climb. The door was locked and the only way in was to dive down from the top. The second I did this, I realized this was from the trailer shot. Initially, I speculated this to be the chasm in the Yuka Clan hideout, but I'm glad to have been proven wrong. The Yensamin Shrine was located at the bottom, being the exact shrine I needed. Inside reminded me of Eventide Island again, practicing attacking with what was around, as well as having no armor to defend my health with. With two days left to go, I phoned a friend for one thing. I had only found one singular Lionel this whole time and I wanted to feel the rush of fighting the difficult enemy again. I was told to go under the Colosseum as it would not disappoint. And let me preface by saying there was no disappointment here. In the middle of the floating Colosseum was a chest that was inaccessible for a moment. Here, I had to beat every single Malice Lionel and they were more difficult. They were slightly faster, had a new horn attack, and were able to run around and away from me attempting to fire an arrow at their face. Down here, you would be able to get the best possible loot and a bunch of arrows. You could easily get 100 plus arrows from fighting these Lionels here alone. The price for going through all this trouble though was absolutely worth it. Majora's Mask. Final preparations began on the 99th day. I went back to the castle to get a few goodies thanks to the Lionels before going down to the chasm. And to be on the safe side, I fought the Silver Lionel again, collecting weapons and parts refusing. The dawn of the final day was here. Day 100. The four sages and I took on the Demon King's army. With the help that they provided, it made taking out all of the enemy waves more efficient. For a brief moment, all of the previous bosses appeared, but the sages assured that they would do the fighting. They then encouraged Link to go to the end and fight the Demon King. 
I'll let him win. He wins. It is Katana. The line. The line. You witness a king's revival. Witness. I always thought it was you would miss. Not witness. And the birth of his new world. Oh my god. Hang on. Since we're here, <laughs> just in case. He knows how to flurry rush? What what is this? What is this what is this scam of a master sword? Dude, what the hell? <laughs> there has to be more than one phase. Finally, a worthy opponent. Look at that. The health? What the? <laughs> like, you could <can> stop now. <laughs> Times five bow came in a clutch. <laughs> Let's go! I got him! He's gonna do it, isn't he? He's gonna do it. became a dragon the demon dragon so i love how much the dragon actually does look like ganondor oh that's such a sick shot Oh, it's his head now. <gasps> That's it. <laughs> that looks so good. I beat the game. Oh, Jesus Christ. Atomic bomb his ass. What a game. It's Sonya and Roru. His power of light and her time power. They found a way to revert her dragon form? Skyward Sword. If that does not scream Skyward Sword, I don't know what would. Or also, um, Castle in the Sky. Is she just... <laughs> do, I, do I have to do it? Okay, but w what if I didn't? <laughs> What? I, I just want to see what happens. We're aiming for that water anyway. Ten. <laughs> the Demon King. Yeah. 